All right, new week, new podcast episode. Thank you guys for joining me on the newest episode of the Impact Co podcast series. My name is Nish. Last time on the podcast, we discussed the artificial intelligence sector, specifically supply chains. That was part two of the artificial intelligence series. Today, I want to have a conversation that's linked to that, especially from a thematic perspective. I want to discuss the Magnificent Seven. Extremely topical uh, companies that have become extremely large in our index. Some companies that we've even discussed before in the likes of Microsoft and Apple. Um, why they're so topical? It's because of how well they've performed over the last couple of years. So just to give you some stats and numbers here. Mag- Magnificent Seven is, of course, made up of seven stocks. The United States equity market went up about 25% last year. If you strip away the Magnificent Seven, that entire market, which comprises about 500 companies, we've only only gone up around 10%. And the Magnificent Seven as a group on their own effectively doubled, went up about 200%. Um, So you can see the quantum of the return the Magnificent Seven is made up of, and you can see how they contribute so much to an individual market like the United States. The United States was effectively the best performing uh, equity area last year if you represent all equities in dollars. Now, in the next episode or the episode after that, if nothing else topical happens, I am going to discuss equity indices because that's a whole interesting topic on its own uh, and how these indices are made up, why they exist, etc. But we'll get into that. For today, though, 30 minutes on the Magnificent Seven, where they came from, why they're important, a quick description of every company in the seven to kind of give you a sense of why they're in the seven, what prospects there are for them, uh, why they are interesting. Now, the interesting thing to start off with is that the Magnificent Seven effectively came from what we used to call the FANG companies, FANG, F-A-A-N-G, and then they sort of got named as FANG M companies after a while. And this leads me to my first controversial area or aspect of the Magnificent Seven, the, the, the naming convention of the group of companies that tend to do well, tend to outperform, get these sort of acronyms or themes associated with them. And my frustration is that we often take the best performing companies, which is a sort of hindsight thing, tend to name them and then use them as a narrative looking forward. And that's often for me problematic. So let's start with FANG. FANG, double A, um, was made up of Facebook, which is now called Meta. So you can't really use FANG anymore, but there you go. Facebook, Apple, Amazon. The N was for Netflix and the G was for Google. That was the original fan companies. After a while, Microsoft started doing exceptionally well, found a new growth vector, which we have discussed in a previous episode, and that got added in as the M. So already you see the sort of hindsight bias start to come up where we can add and remove companies as we see fit. How did Fang M effectively morph into that Magnificent Seven? It had everything to do with AI. So the idea was is that this Magnificent Seven group of companies would effectively benefit the most from the AI revolution. So what are the companies in the Magnificent Seven? It is similar to Fang in that we have Meta, we have Apple, we have Amazon, we have Google, which is effectively Alphabet in the context of this conversation, um, Nvidia, Tesla, and Microsoft. So that's effectively a seven. You'll note that you'll notice that Netflix kind of dropped away. But in this conversation, I'm actually going to keep Netflix in the mix to sort of depict this transition from Fang into the Magnificent Seven. But we're going to discuss why AI matters and how these companies are supposed to grow based on this AI theme. You'll know from my two episodes on AI that I'm not that obsessed with artificial intelligence necessarily, but more from the sort of machine learning data computational aspect where we are crunching a lot more data. And if we can and have the ability to crunch more data, how does that create new revenue models for these companies? How does does this create new opportunities for these companies? And the seven effectively have, or in theory, have the best optionality given this new world that we're in of artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. So that's sort of where we're going. Uh, Just to get the disclaimers out the way, as you know, I may hold these stocks in a professional or personal capacity. I do hold a number of the Magnificent Seven stocks. Uh, The other thing is, this is for information and educational purposes rather than financial advice. You should seek financial advice from a financial advisor. This podcast doesn't give you financial advice at all.
All right, so let's start. I want to go through the companies in brief, uh, every one of the Magnificent Seven, and then talk about why it's topical and what we can maybe expect going forward. Because the natural narrative that we have here is that because these companies have done so well in 2023, there must be some return to normality in 2024. They can't continue to outperform. That outperformance must lead to some underperformance. It's kind of the cyclicality of stock return, cyclicality of economies, etc. So if we can understand these companies just a little bit, then maybe it's going to give us an idea of where they could go into the future. And let's start with the two that we've already had podcasts on because we can get them out of the way quite quickly, Apple and Microsoft. Let's start with Apple. Why is Apple considered a beneficiary of the AI revolution or an artificial intelligence company? Well, if we go from back to front, the most recent thing we've seen on Apple is the Apple, Apple Vision Pro headset. That's a sort of artificial reality or mixed reality headset rather than true artificial intelligence. But it sort of puts puts forth a brand new revenue model for Apple going into the future. Is this the new way we're going to compute? And with all the computational power available, can Apple create more and better and smaller Vision Pro headsets that's going to become the way that we compute in the future. That's how you get from better data and better computational ability all the way to a brand new consumer-based product. Now, I have mixed opinions on the Vision Pro. And in the Apple episode, we talked about how Apple needs new revenue streams outside of the iPhone. I don't think the Vision Pro is there yet, but... Vision Pro is probably the worst version of itself right now. So it it will be interesting to see where Apple goes from there. For me, more importantly on Apple from an AI, better computation perspective, better data perspective, is the M chips or the A chips that are now going into your phone or your laptop or your iPad. That has been an extremely important theme as we've been able to process more data as foundries like Taiwan Semiconductor have become more uh, reliable, more viable. Apple has started to create their own chips and have relied less on companies like, say, Intel to provide chips into their devices. This has made their devices a lot more powerful. And if they can make their devices more powerful while keeping the price point reasonable, we just have more and more computing power in our hands. Now, I will say off the Magnificent 7, Apple is probably one of the weaker ones in terms of its adoption. It has very specific adoption levels all on sort of device perspective. And we're not exactly sure if Apple is going to be able to do what they need to do in terms of innovation to truly benefit from this new world of computing power. It's in the Magnificent Seven, partly because of everything it's done. It's a product that sort of permeates our lives. If you think about computing, our access to the cloud via iCloud, etc., as well as the new chips, as well as the, the mixed reality headset. But a big part of Apple being in the Seven is the fact that it's now a multi-trillion dollar company, the largest company in the world. So it's partly a, a prior performance Thing, that this thing has done so well across so many different subjects that it sort of forces its way into the Magnificent Seven, even though it's not necessarily an AI company, uh, very much like how it forced its way into the FANG companies and now just inherits that kind of moniker in the Magnificent Seven. So that's Apple. Microsoft's an easy one because we've already discussed it, but an interesting one because unlike Apple, it actually benefits a lot from this AI revolution. Uh, I talked about it in the podcast episode. Microsoft was kind of meandering along at some stage. They weren't really generating that much revenue. You bought a specific version of, say, Office or the Microsoft operating system. You never really upgraded it. People often use pirated versions of, of, of that software. Um, so Microsoft was really struggling to generate revenue at a certain stage. Satya Nadella then becomes CEO. He was CEO of the cloud division before he became CEO. And he sort of pushed this sort of unity and this oneness and effectively one driveness, if I could call it that, in Microsoft, where you've now got the sort of platform company, where Microsoft, the operating system, now exists online. It exists in this upgraded world where everything's sort of linked together in this always-on environment. You kind of need OneDrive and you need Teams and you need the operating system to all sort of work together and to be able to be updated into the cloud. So Microsoft has really changed from this, I'll, I'll buy an operating system every time I buy a computer to I'm going to pay Microsoft every single month, every single year to have the best software capability so that I can integrate my hardware and software into the cloud. 
And that is the whole Azure ecosystem. From that perspective, I think that Microsoft has the best opportunity to benefit from AI in the cloud because we want to move our data into the cloud. We want to compute in the cloud. And if you think about, especially from a work perspective, how much Microsoft dominates, if we want to move into sort of platform ecosystem, we're probably going to do it with something like Microsoft because it permeates, especially our work lives a lot, but also our personal lives quite a lot. So for me, one of the biggest AI beneficiaries big data beneficiaries, computing beneficiaries is Microsoft. Not only from the cloud side, but also from the software side. You'll know that Microsoft has an investment in OpenAI, which effectively owns ChatGPT. And we're seeing a lot of now AI level, co-piloting, large language model, software services starting to be incorporated into things like Edge, the, the online browser, into things like Microsoft Office, where in theory, it'll be able to take minutes on your meetings, give you feedback and insights on things in real time, in Edge, be able to scour the internet better. And this is again, a big change. I mean, five years ago, we'd never talk about Edge or Microsoft Explorer as a viable browser. It was always Chrome and Firefox, but now we are because it's all in integrated into this platform and it makes sense to use it. So for me, Microsoft is really gonna dominate, I think in the next 10 or 15 years when it comes to AI, big data computing and taking advantage of that. Okay, so that's Microsoft and Apple. Let's flick over to Amazon, which we think of as a retail company, but in this context, Amazon's predominant profit driver as we sit here today is Amazon Web Services, a business that was built inside Amazon to sort of service Amazon itself, but then Amazon very quickly realized could be a viable business on its own. So Amazon Web Services, when it began, was all about generating insights for Amazon. Uh, how much do we sell of baby powder in a specific month? And is it seasonal? Is it cyclical? Can we generate more data on that? Can we understand it better? And you can understand how from a retail perspective, generating that data and themes was super powerful, wasn't really being done in retail. What Amazon realized is that they could spin out a lot of that data capability to other companies that also needed insights using their own data. And that's created this cloud infrastructure where you could use Amazon Web Services and Amazon Web Services tools to give you better data, better insight into your own company. So important was that and so lucrative was that it became a primary profit driver for Amazon because retail is not a super profitable business. Um, and now AWS is basically the dominant part of the Amazon valuation. As part of AWS, you get cloud services for compute, for data storage, etc. So that's how Amazon fits into the AI revolution. Amazon's of course dominated for a long time in terms of share price performance. So it was in the FANG grouping before, it's now in the Magnificent Seven grouping. Uh, next company that's in the grouping is Facebook. It was the F in Fang, but now it's changed to Meta, uh, the name that is. So now it's part of the Magnificent Seven. Why is Meta in this grouping from an AI perspective? It's from a very specific angle. And that angle's changed subtly over the last year or two. Uh, you'll remember sort of two years ago, uh, Mark Zuckerberg wanted to create effectively a virtual reality environment, which is different from the Apple Vision Pro. This is where you're completely in a virtual reality world, experiencing virtual reality from a school perspective to a work perspective to a meeting friends perspective. Um, it's almost like Ready Player One in virtual reality sense, if you take that fiction example into what he wanted for the real world. Now, at that stage, Facebook actually did really poorly. They were spending a lot of money on virtual reality. There wasn't much coming out of that division and it looked pedestrian, if I put it that way. If you compare it to the sort of sci-fi world we had focused on in Ready Player One, what was coming out of Meta after spending billions of dollars looked very childish. Um, they've kind of reworked that and virtual reality stepped down to the sort of background and they're using better data computing and better machine learning in an algorithm sense to make us engage better with Facebook properties. Now, if you didn't know, Facebook is Facebook, the thing our, things our parents and grandparents post on nowadays. That's a 3 billion user ecosystem. You then got Instagram, 
which is owned by Facebook, a 2 billion user ecosystem, which is extremely popular, especially young, the young, amongst the younger demographic. You've then got something like WhatsApp, which has about 2 billion users itself. Um, that's also where our grandparents post their, their WhatsApp stories. Um, not really being monetized necessarily, but a big user base. How is Instagram driving engagement? Well, they've learned a lot from TikTok. You'll remember, and TikTok probably has about a one and a half billion users right now. You'll remember from a couple of years ago that TikTok seemed to be stealing a lot of Facebook's lunch. It just seemed like we stopped using Instagram and we were moving on to TikTok. And one of the primary reasons why we did that is because the algorithm was supposedly better. You remember that? Well, it, Instagram, and, I, and fa this is Facebook now, has learned a lot from that and has spent a lot of time using better data computation, better machine learning to build algorithms that better give us information, better give us what we want in terms of engagement. So now when you're scrolling through Reels in particular, you'll notice that Reels has become a lot smarter in terms of giving you the content you really want, very much like TikTok. So that artificial intelligence spend is now shifting off into sort of the Reels algorithm rather than VR in directly competing with TikTok. Why is that important from an Instagram perspective? Well, it's because Instagram and Facebook generate their revenue via advertising and thus generate their revenue by engagement, via you staying on the platform long enough that you will get an ad come up every few minutes or so. So the more time they can get you to spend uh, inside the app, the better from a monetization perspective. Effectively, 90% to 100% of revenue for Facebook comes out of advertising dollars, which is eyeballs on screen. So that's how Facebook sort of is a beneficiary of the AI revolution. I think it gets adopted into the Magnificent Seven because of its adoption into the FANG group and has done quite well, especially post the sort of VR slump it had uh, last year or so. Now, the next company that technically isn't in the Magnificent Seven, but for me should be, should, should at least be grandfathered across from the fan companies is Netflix. Um, I can understand how it it isn't necessarily taking advantage of the AI revolution, but it's a crucial company in the context of our world, especially in a new segment like streaming. Um, we all know what Netflix does, or at least we should do. I was quite concerned about Netflix a couple of years ago because I realized that there were a number of new competitors. If you think about things like Disney Plus, HBO Max, Peacock, and Netflix always benefited early on from being the, the, the non-threatening party in the room. So a number of companies would license their content onto Netflix. They didn't really have to make their own content. They made a couple of things like House of Cards and series like that, but they licensed a lot of it so that you'd have a large content library. I got worried about Netflix when new competitors came online because people started to hoard their, their, their properties. HBO kept theirs back. Same with Peacock and the NBC property, same with Disney. And that loss of content for me was quite concerning because it mean that it, it meant that Netflix would have to spend a lot more money to generate their own content, which they did. It became very expensive. The competition also meant that to a certain extent, they were losing some subscribers and they really needed a subscriber count to stay high because they needed to charge subscribers more to effectively build this content library from scratch. And that was a worrying time for Netflix. Fast forward now to sort of 2023, 2024, and they have managed to increase revenue by charging more. People are sticking around. They have become sort of an anchor tenant for streaming. You have Netflix and then something else because their content library is large enough. We've seen a couple of streaming sites do poorly, so they're keeping their licensed content on Netflix. And Netflix have become smarter about content. If you think about a new show on Netflix like The Trust, to create the trust, which is a bunch of people staying in a house and we sort of follow their story for a few weeks. It isn't as expensive as making a Bridgerton or a house of cards. Um, so they've become smarter at generating new content. Um, so Netflix went from this period of pain to now this period of profitability again. And it is actually doing exceptionally well. Uh, you'll see that reflected in the share price. Just two more left. Now it's NVIDIA and Tesla. If I start NVIDIA, it's actually a pretty simple one. I discussed it a bit in the AI episode. 
They make GPUs. Those GPUs went into gaming devices, editing devices, generally computers, um, and sort of gaming stations. So it was a sort of PC gaming company, PC edit software editing company. Uh, when I say software, the hardware that helps the software do what it needs to do. And it dominated in that category. It is one of the best, in fact, the best GPU in the world were generally NVIDIA GPUs. Now, the strength of NVIDIA, because it's gone up hundreds of percents in the last year or two, doesn't necessarily come from gaming. They're still dominant in gaming. But where it's coming from is on the cloud computing side. NVIDIA make a very specific GPU that sits inside cloud servers that help it process things that it needs to process. Remember, when you store your data in the cloud, when you do calculations in the cloud via things like AWS, you need a CPU and a GPU to work together to do that. You, you've effectively got an off-site computer that you're working with. And NVIDIA make GPUs that are effectively second to none. So companies like Microsoft in growing OneDrive and Azure, companies like Apple in growing the iCloud database that they need, which needs server farms, Google in terms of the Google Cloud infrastructure, um, requires NVIDIA GPUs and that side of their business has thus grown dramatically. Um, the market expects it to grow far faster than it is growing right now, which is why the share price is reflective of that. And I'll discuss that in a second just now. But effectively, NVIDIA is doing well because of this new need to, to grow servers, server farms, server databases. So it's directly benefiting from this AI machine learning data computation theme. Um, the last one's Tesla. And Tesla is, in theory, benefiting from AI because of its ability to do self-driving cars, its ability for its car to sort of software update itself, its ability for this car to be a tech product rather than a vehicle. But quite frankly, Tesla has been included into, mag into the Magnificent 7 because of sheer price performance. If you look at Tesla's share price over a number of years, it is staggering how high it got in certain stages. Now, my concern is that that is falling off quite dramatically now, and the reasons are quite important. So we thought EVs would dominate the world in this world where we want to go to sort of net zero using much less carbon, much less fossil fuels. That is still the case, quite frankly, but Tesla is now slipping because of dram a dramatic increase in competition. If you think about companies like Porsche, Volvo, uh, VW, and specifically the Asian competitors like BYD, there is significantly more competition in the EV space than there was a few years ago. So Tesla doesn't dominate as much as it used to. Tesla's also sort of dropped the ball in a couple of areas. The Cybertruck, for example, is a very specific product. And quite frankly, I don't like the look of it. I don't think it can dominate like their other models have done. And the way Tesla builds a car is effectively retrofitting a factory to try and do as much of it in-house as possible. That's very different from other car companies, which basically source a number of products and components and then build it together. Now, Tesla's done well because they build their products effectively from scratch all the way up. But it does mean that for a new version of a Tesla, it does take quite a long time to come out. And we've seen that versions of Teslas come out very, very slowly. I think the Cybertruck was a mistake because not only is it a great I don't think it's a great design. I think guys like Rivian have made better trucks and even the Ford Electric is a better truck. But it also sets you back in terms of building a new version of your next vehicle because you have to retrofit a factory again. That leaves Tesla quite far behind everyone else. Their products, even though look futuristic, have become a little bit stale from a design perspective. And you actually have to cut prices now because the products from BYD, Rivian, the Porsche, etc., are now so compelling that you can't charge the price point that you used to. So Tesla has started to slip from those perspectives. There's also governance issues with Elon Musk. We know the ketamine issues. We know issues with him trying to control the company more. He seems distracted from a Twitter perspective. So for the, from, from those various reasons, Tesla doesn't seem as bulletproof as it used to be. I realize I forgot one. Um, if you are sort of if the more eagle-eyed viewers and listeners are, are looking out there, Google's the one I didn't mention. And Google benefits from the cloud in, in sort of ways that we should understand too. Most of Google's infrastructure is online uh, via Google Cloud, for example. Their workspaces like 
um, their Google Docs, Google Excel, Gmail, Maps, etc. All of that has gotten a lot better because computational power has gotten better. If you think about the Android operating system, which Google owns, that's gotten a heck of a lot better um, because there is better data computational power. Our phones are stronger, so Android can be better, faster, have new features, etc. You might not know this. You probably do. Google also owns YouTube, so the YouTube algorithm has also gotten a lot stronger thanks to machine learning and data learning. Now, for me, Google has the problem of having 90 to 100% of its revenue come from search specifically. Now, search relates to the revenue that Google gets from you browsing on the internet. You know, you know the paid ads that you see as you scroll through Google, as well as the ads that come up inside websites. That is predominantly how Google makes money. Their money from cloud, Android, etc., is all a lot smaller than that revenue. Uh, the problem is with this AI race, I think that that search advertising starts to reduce quite dramatically because we're going to interact with the internet very differently thanks to large language models like ChatGPT. And Google's actually fallen behind quite dramatically there. Yes, they do have Bard slash Gemini, but that is slow to the uptake versus everything else. And I think their other services, especially their cloud services, aren't as strong as some of the competitors like iCloud and OneDrive. So Google, I think, suffers a little bit. All right, so that, that's sort of a, a very quick summary of the seven. And why I wanted to give you that quick summary is so that you have a working knowledge of what those seven do, but more than that, what the current sort of talking points are around them. And it brings us to a very important point. If, if I just go through the seven again and just sort of give you an up or a down on whether they're in a sort of positive space or negative space. Apple, sort of in a negative space, needs innovation. Microsoft, definitely positive space, moving in the right direction from a number of reasons. Amazon, positive space, benefiting significantly from AWS. Google, probably negative space. I think their business is more impacted negatively from new themes in AI that they haven't been able to benefit from. Facebook, positive. They've been able to benefit from better algorithms, etc. Netflix, positive, not necessarily AI positive, but positive because they figured things out. You know, they managed to get more revenue and charge us more. Having ad tiers, pass, cracking down on password sharing has driven up their revenue. While on the cost side, they've been able to get better at generating content. So Netflix is on the positive end. NVIDIA, positive end uh, because their GPUs are so sought after by those in the industry uh, in terms of cloud computing, server farms, etc. And then Tesla, probably on the negative end. You know, they struggled with a couple of very key ideas. Now, why that's important is because I want to talk about valuation. There's this idea in the media that if these things have gone up 200% in 2023, that they must come down. And for me, that's not how it works. The way that we price anything in a market, especially companies, is by thinking about the future, not necessarily the past. The stock price of a company is reflective of what's going to happen rather than what has happened. And here's what I mean by that. When you value a company and when you buy a share in a company, you are buying it based on future earnings, not on past earnings. That always gets people confused when I talk about it, especially from a lecturing perspective. But here's what I mean. I'll give it to you in a practical example. If you were going to buy a doctor's practice today, specifically doctor's practice, what are you actually buying? Yes, the money that you pay up front is going to buy the doctor's equipment. It's going to maybe buy a property that the doctor owns. It's going to buy some of the consumable stuff like gloves and masks, etc. But what are you really paying for when you buy a doctor's practice? You're paying for the book of clients that that doctor has. And that is crucial to understand because that book of clients, in theory, is this recurring source of revenue in the future if these patients continue to come to the practice. So the property that you buy, the gloves and the equipment, etc., that's all a part of the valuation. But generally, the far bigger part of the valuation and the bigger part of the price is that future revenue, future earnings. It's exactly the same when you're buying a company in real life. If you're buying and I've talked about this in previous episodes. If you're buying Apple today, you're not buying it for the phones it has sold. You're buying it for the phones it will sell. If you're buying Microsoft, you're buying it for the future narrative around AWS, etc. Uh, not AWS. You're buying it for OneDrive, etc. Rather than what has happened in the past with their Nokia phone debacle, etc. 
That's crucial in this context because you'll notice that across a number of these companies, and I'll name them, NVIDIA, Netflix, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, I have a quite compelling narrative about the future related to big data computing, a changing world around artificial intelligence, a changing world around new and viable product streams and product revenue, etc. And when share prices increase dramatically like they've done, they are often factoring in this new information. We has as analysts, portfolio managers, market participants, need to understand whether that increase in price is reflective of that increase in narrative. Because if the increase in price matches the benefits of the increase in narrative, then you're paying a fair price for something. There are a lot of valuation techniques to be able to work out what something is worth and, and worth, and we'll probably get to that at some stage. But just so you know now, the fact that Magnificent, the Magnificent Seven companies have rallied, have done really well, is not necessarily the reason to sell them because a number of them have done well in share price perspective because the underlying companies have also started to do really well. So that increased share price is reflective of better underlying fundamentals. That's how we talk about it in sort of finance jargon. So don't take for granted that the Magnificent Seven, because they've gone up, must come down. I say for a number of them, there are very good levers and vectors that could see them do extremely well into 2024. The one thing that I would say though, and this is crucial, is that prices of companies inside a stock market are generally influenced by the economy that they exist in. And in either the next episode or the episode after, depending on whether we have new information or new things running around, I really wanna talk about companies and company profits in the context of economies and how recessions and interest rates affect that. So that'll probably be either the next episode or the episode after, depending on how I feel about talking about things like indices, S&P 500 versus say the NASDAQ, etc., or any current topic that comes up. If you've listened to this podcast, you'll see how we're fitting these stories together now. The narratives are embedding into each other. We're going to go deeper into our understanding of certain areas and then come back up for air and learn about new basic topics also. So hopefully you're sort of finding good value out of this. Um, we'll take it in a few different directions, as I said earlier in the podcast series. Uh, but that's the end. I am at the end of the Magnificent Seven conversation. At least we'll pick this up in the next episode. If you've gotten to this point, I, I truly value your time. I know how much there is to listen to out there. Uh, if you can, it would be great if you could subscribe to us on the podcast channel you're listening to or on YouTube. Uh, a like or a review is always great. A comment on something like a YouTube would be fantastic. You can reach out to us on Instagram, which is a great format, but we're also putting out a lot more TikTok. So have a look at that. I'm just trying to break down concepts and give you quick feedback on things. And between a reel and a TikTok, it's a really good format to do that. So look out for that a little bit more. Other than that, I'll see you in two weeks for the next episode. Thank you so much for joining. All the best and cheers.